All right, guys, welcome back as we continue to plow through the Word of God. Man, praise the Lord, 52, 52 days, you've made it. You've actually stuck with reading through the Bible, not just in one year, but two years, because most of you couldn't finish in one year, so we needed two years. Amen, right, Rich, on that one? Yep, we need a lot of time. Yeah, we need a lot of time. So here's the deal, we just finished Genesis. Our one word for Genesis was what, Kevin? Seed. Seed. And so what you have is on the backdrop. All right, TJ, come with me. So on the backdrop, we're going to have Mindy. Remember, she's been painting one word, one word for the book of Genesis, which is the word seed. So our whole goal for the 66 books, okay, is to identify one word that's going to point to the Messiah. So in Genesis, we believe in Genesis 3.15, you have the seed of enmity. You have this Jesus Christ coming in and actually taking care of the deal. And there's a whole lot there from the seed of Abraham all the way through the seed of of the Messiah. And so it's a beautiful picture, but that's the one word. And so our goal is, is for everyday people like you and me to say, I can remember 66 words that point to the Messiah. And so to see if we can do that well, we brought in some guests today, not, not just the peanut gallery, but like legit guys that I think might know the word of God. And so I got some good friends that we've been doing life with over the course of the couple years. And so you got Josh and Scott and Gary and Jordan and Mike. And we're just going to try, what does it look like if we integrate their thoughts with their thoughts, my thoughts, and we'll just see if we make progress. Is this, is this turn into a game show? It feels like a competition. <laughs> this group, and they're sitting higher than you as well. This is awesome. And little they know is not only, you know, we're on the radio, our students in Indiana are watching, we've got people all over the United States. And so one word, okay, so our first word for Genesis is seed. Since they're just joining us, I'll get you up to date on Exodus. So the painting back here, I know it's kind of hard to see. But the painting back here that we talked about through, uh, what, 40 chapters was Jesus is the deliverer. Crazy, crazy verse on Jude 1.5. Kevin, can you just go there? Because I feel like this is super important and powerful to get us to the point of Leviticus. In Jude 1.5, it says, Now I want to remind you, though you know all these things, watch. The Lord first saved a people out of Egypt. The Lord, Jesus Christ, saved his people out of Egypt. Jesus was the one who delivered his people out of Egypt. Isn't that awesome? And later destroyed those who did not believe. So you have Jesus as a seed, then you have Jesus as the deliverer, and now we're in Leviticus. Now, I'm just going to tell you, when I went to seminary, it wasn't one of those classes that I was like, ah, oh, this is going to be a humdinger. This sounds really good. But just to make sure I'm, I'm kosher, I brought an in-house Jewish person. That was good. I think that's actually funny. And so we brought Gary here, who Gary is, Gary, how long have you been Jewish, did you say? Uh, all my life. All his life. Once you're a Jew, you're always a Jew. Okay. And so, uh, you know, guys, feel free anytime you're going to grab a mic, jump on in. But Gary, you said something about what the, the name Leviticus means. You remember what Leviticus means? It's, in Hebrew, it's Vaikra, and he called or names. He called or names. And he called. And so I, I love this. I mean, when can you go to a guy that just says, hey, could you tell me the Hebrew here? All right, so here's the deal, okay? On the book of Leviticus, we have one word. I'm going to get to it later on in teaching. But the one word, let's go to Minnie's painting because when you start off a book, I mean, this is pretty cool. Isn't this, I mean, this is powerful to me. Our one word of Jesus is the word atonement. I'm going to describe what the word atonement means. Don't worry. So you have the seed, you have the deliverer, and now you have the atonement. And I promise you, all of the Old, Te the, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, it always points to Yeshua. It always points to the Messiah. And so this is kind of a fun thing. You know, Leviticus. I'm going to state some of the obvious things because I think as everyday people, when we read the Word of God, I think we make this way too hard. Leviticus, is, it's relating to the Levites. I mean, you have the 12 tribes, and guess what? It's writing to, yes, relating to the Levites. It's requirements of what you're going to see of the Mosaic Covenant. And so what we're saying is, and I love what Gordon Wenham says. He's going to be one of my new commentator guys, just so you guys know, right? Okay. Gordon Wenham, he says this, it's not just a manual for priests concerned uh, with laity and the role they play in worship. So not just for priests, but it's for everyday people. The Israelites that are now, and Scott, we were talking about this during the break, uh, this is for all of the Israelites. And so what you have is, remember, the backdrop is, is here you have the tabernacle, Moses and Bezalel and Oholiab and all of the Israelites. Remember, they came together, they anointed this thing, they, they blessed this thing, they built this thing, and now here they are in the wilderness, and God says, I'm going to give you some more instructions. I'm going to give you some more directions. I'm giving you a manual of how I want you to interact with me here. That's really what the tabernacle is. How can you dwell in my presence? But I got to give you some rules. I got to give you some regulations. That sounds weird to new covenant people. Like, ah, you know, I don't know if I want those rules and regulations, but God uses those to keep people in line. Like, here's an example. Wenham says, you know, when do I go to the sanctuary? 
Like, how do I do this? When do I, uh, what am I supposed to bring? Do I bring a sheep or do I bring a goat? <laughs> do I bring a bull or do I bring a pigeon? Uh, you know, and then what are they, the priests supposed to do? These guys that have the holy garments, uh, you know, Aaron and his sons, how are they supposed to dress? How often do they wear this stuff? And then also at the same time, crazy enough in the book of Leviticus, there's only a few, few sections that actually apply to the priests, which means this is a book even though, yes, the Leviticus mentality is for the Levites, it's really for everyday people. How do you approach me in the presence of God? It's, it's a cool picture. And so here's something that I didn't know. And maybe, maybe Gary, you, can, you could address this just being Jewish. But uh, one of the commentators says, Rooker says that this is one of the very first books that they teach Jewish children. Is that they go to Leviticus because it, it creates this clean lanes of people to follow their ways. And I thought, you know, what a hard book to start off with. You know what, Rich? This is the, the one-year Bible killer right here. It's Leviticus. I mean, when you get to Leviticus, sorry, Gary, I know you love Leviticus. I'm just talking about regular, everyday evangelicals. Taylor, I'm pretty sure this is the one that would bring you down. He didn't even read. He didn't even read Exodus. So <laughs> Genesis did that to him. So just so you know, okay? But I, I just, I'm telling you, but when you begin to see the atonement and how all of this points to the Messiah, Man, it's awesome. And then you begin to see so much come to life. One of the central themes, uh, aside from atonement, is at Sailhammer, one of the commentators that we reference often, is, is this holiness theme of how do I fulfill, you guys remember Exodus 19.6? You guys, that's all right, if you don't. Go to Exodus 19.6. And remember, we talked about these, these things. In fact, in, in verse 5, Kevin, go to verse 5 if you would. Remember about how Jesus, or God identifies the Israelites, one, as he is a, a special possession for me. These are my people. These are the treasure that I'm after, right? And then he goes to verse six. And then he also says, but also remember, you're the kingdom of priests. You are the kingdom of priests. And then he says, and you're my holy nation. He says, you're my special treasure. You're the kingdom of priests and you're my holy nation. So now you have to take Exodus and say, okay, now I'm going to give you a manual on how to do this. So what happens is Leviticus, all of 1 through 27, becomes a manual for Exodus 19, 5, and 6. It's a cool picture because if you think about this, God's called you to something. He's called us to something. Can you imagine if we didn't have this? Oh, yeah, I've called you. You've been anointed. But the reality is we need help. And this is the help that they're getting. And so let's be real practical. They're in the wilderness. Scott, we were talking about this. They're in the wilderness. I don't know how to interact with this. Like, I don't know how to engage the, the what, what do I do at the basin? What am I supposed to do with this altar thing? Or where do I enter? Or do I have to wear certain things? Like we're tangible people. We need these things. And so it says in Leviticus 1, verse 1, Then the Lord summoned Moses. He spoke to him from the tent of meeting. Pretty cool picture. In verse 2, this is what he says. Speak to the Israelites and tell them, When any of you, okay, so... Uh, can I go to the, you guys for a second? This is our first time, guys, doing this. Uh, like when he says, speak to the Israelites, his audience is who? The Israelites. All of the Israelites. It's not just to like, oh, by the way, just speak to the priests. Everybody. I want you, when any of you brings an offering. Okay, so this mentality is, is that everybody's in this picture right now. When any of you brings an offering to the Lord from the livestock, you may bring your offering from the herd or the flock. Now, this word offering, okay? I don't want to take anything for granted like, oh, yeah, I know what that, Rich, you know what offering means? Just if you were just to define offering, maybe I should ask Taylor. Uh, a token to the Lord. Ooh, that actually sounded remotely smart. Yeah. <laughs> Good guess. Go, Taylor. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I, I think you're right, Taylor. I mean, Nelson just says it's to bring near that which one brings near to God. So whatever you're bringing to the table, whatever you have this token, it's going to allow you to draw near to his presence. And so the scripture just says, you may bring your offering. So you're bringing something, a token, a, a herd, something from the herd or from the flock so that you can draw closer to him. OK, remember, they don't know how to draw closer to him. They don't know how to get into the tent of meeting. They don't know how to get into, into the entrance. Oh, by the way, I need you to bring in an offering so that you can. This is your I got your golden ticket mentality. I, I'm going to give you a golden ticket. Here's how you now approach the throne. And this is, again, it sounds simple, but we don't take time to learn this. And you imagine the Israelites. Now watch what it says in verse three. If his gift, OK, that, that's just it can be either or. If his gift is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to bring an unblemished male. He must bring it to the entrance to the tent of the meeting so that he may be accepted by the Lord. OK, so a couple requirements. OK, we are going to start talking about this burnt offering before we get there. 
Can anybody remember in Genesis where we've heard about a burnt offering before? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Where in Cain and Abel? Does it say burnt offering? It doesn't say burnt. Okay, thanks. Now you're killing me, Kevin. Sorry. It's an offering. That's good. Okay, there's gonna, you're going to learn a couple of different offerings here. Okay, so you're right. But go to Genesis 8, 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. He took some kind of every clean animal and every kind of clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Think about this. Abraham and Isaac. Abraham and Isaac. I, Abraham was to offer as a burnt offering his own son. So here you have this continual image of how everything continues to build. And then go to Exodus 18, verse 11. Exodus 18, verse 11. I don't know how far we're going to get today, but there's a lot here on Leviticus. Uh, and then can you go to verse 12, Kevin? Let's just see if it's there. Yeah, okay. So here's what happens. And so this is cool. Uh, jo Jethro, Jethro, and Mo that's Moses' father-in-law, he brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. Remember when the Israelites gathered together? So Moses' father-in-law know something about a burnt offering. So even though they didn't have this in place, this language of a burnt offering wasn't completely foreign. And so now all of a sudden, I mean, just, those are cool little insights I feel like that begin to help. Now, here's what I want you to do in verse three of Leviticus one. I want you to make sure you're gonna bring an unblemished male, okay? So you're gonna only bring a male, okay? You're gonna bring a, a bull, okay? You're gonna bring a bull, unblemished, unblemished. Uh, Scott, you got any idea? Josh, any idea what unblemished means? You know, a lot of animals in the herd are, you know, they've got defects or they got scars or, you know, crooked eye or something. <laughs> I think this would just be, you know, I was raised on a farm, so I've seen, you know, animals that are blemished. And I think there are very few that are pure. Yeah. So I think that's what unblemished means. Yeah, and think about this. That's a, like the very best. wow, it's like, we got in-house theologians here. This is awesome. Yeah, yeah we're done. I'm out. But I was going to go to a painting, but it's actually over here. Remember the unblemished lamb? Remember in Passover, remember they have to sit for how long? 14 days. Isn't that right? Is it in 14 days that they have to make sure that it's, that it's perfect, that it's unblemished? And so the point is, is like, it's a big deal that you can't bring a, a, a sheep with a crooked eye. <laughs> that's awesome. Right? But that's what we want. We want an unblemished bull. And it has to be a male. And now here's the process. He must bring it to the entrance of the, uh, to the tent of the meeting so that he may be accepted by the Lord. So to me, this is a qualifier. If you're going to come to this place, you need to follow what I'm asking you to do. You need to actually bring what I've asked you to do. Bring an unblemished male bull and then I'll accept you. I mean, it's kind of a cool image. But man, I'd sure hate to, to not get it right. And what happens to me is over the course of time, it will feel like more and more it's a weight. Like, did I get that one right or did I not get that one right? Did I work today or did I not work today? Like there, it becomes these 612, Kevin, rules and regulations that 613, 613, 735. All right. Is it, it you know what it does? It feels like, what if I can't remember this one? And then what if I can't remember this one? Or did I, is this, is this perfect enough? Or what if the priest looks at it and says, dude, that guy has a really bad paw or a weird tail. I don't know, whatever. I'm trying to describe an animal here. A hoof, a paw. It's like cats, cats, dogs. That's all I know. It's not like I hung out with sheep and goats. Apparently Scott has though. So anyway, and so here you have this, this is what he's supposed to bring. Now, and it goes through this process and I'm going to do a cheat sheet real quick. I know we're going to read through this, but I want to make sure that we get to this. Okay. So when you're going to present these things now, first of all, right. Okay. This is kind of cool. You guys can't see this, but Rich built this just so you guys know there's a, there's a camera right here. I've never done that before, but anyway. Uh, and so what we're writing here, our, our, our guys are going to see and gals are going to see. Number one is this, right? When he comes to the entrance, they're supposed to present the offering. Okay. So number one is, is that there's going to actually be a presentation. Okay. It's hard to actually come to the place if you don't have anything to bring. So number one, you're going to have a presentation. Okay. As it continues on, watch what it says in, in verse five uh, of Leviticus five, it says he is to slaughter the bull before the Lord. Okay. So now go back to, I, I want to make sure in verse four, after you present this, Kevin, go back to verse four. Thanks. Okay. We already said this, but I want you to lay your hands, lay hands on his head. So after the presentation, then you're going to lay your hands, uh, on the animal. Okay. For in this context, just for the, the burnt offering, we're just going to say it's a bull. 
We're going to learn later on, if you're middle class, you have sheep and goats. If you're poor, you're going to have birds, okay? But in this context right now, I want you to make sure you put your hands on the head. Now watch as it continues to, to grow. It says, he is to slaughter, okay? He is to slaughter the sacrifice. So at this point, who's doing the killing? Whoever's bringing the sacrifice. Yeah, the offerer, the donor. This is not the priest. I think that's interesting to me because I guess in my mind, I always thought, oh, yeah, hey, priest, they got to do all the work. No, they supervise. They supervise. <laughs> like construction workers on a highway. You're doing great, Rich. Good job, Kevin. Keep it up. <laughs> Sometimes I think things are funny, but nobody else does. So... <laughs> We laugh just to amuse you. Yeah, I know you do. All right, so watch, though. He slaughters the bull. Now watch, okay, as it continues on. Now here's what we're going to do. I want to jump over to the priests, okay? It says that Aaron's sons, the priests, are to present the blood and sprinkle it on all sides of the altar that is at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And so what you're going to see here is, is that they are to collect the blood, right, and then sprinkle and what you'll start seeing in the New Testament is that word sprinkle is all over the place. It's really cool to start seeing how these things, when we present the offering, when we're putting our hands on it, when we're doing the killing, I think that's really important because honestly for me, in all my life, I thought it was always the priest doing the killing. But the most common offering, and yeah, there's the sin offering as well and the burnt offering, but this is where they're doing it right here at the brazen altar. And so here you have these killings. Look, slaughter tables. Uh, Table number one, I got, a, I got a bowl. Okay, table number two. I mean, that's what the priest does. Table number three, like he's telling them which table to go to. I hate blood, you guys. I would pass out before, I would die because I couldn't sacrifice anything. I'd be like, I can't. When Maya was really sick, I'd sit there and she'd get blood transfusions. They're like, sir, are you okay? Yeah, I need one, please. You know, like it just didn't go well. So presentation, lay your hands on the bowl, slaughter the sacrifice. And now the priest, okay, just so we have... All right, let's do this. We, got, we like doing some colors here. Okay. Oh, that's really, you probably can't see that. Can you see that okay? Okay, so you have the priests, and then you have, we'll just say the people. So the people are presenting, laying your hands, slaughter the sacrifice, collecting and sprinkling. And now let's keep going through here, okay? Scripture just continues uh, in verse 6. Then he must skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. We're just talking about one offering here, okay? So uh, I'm going to go to number five. Here's your process. You're going to skin and cut up. Does anybody, do any of you guys hunt at all? Yes, you do? Do you like, do you skin your animals? Do you do any of that ever before? No, but I've never done it. Have you ever done it before, Gary? Yeah, like this is, you have to do this back then. Like it, you can, it's not easy. It's not easy. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. You want to jump in here? Oh yeah, use your mic. Okay, it's not easy. It's totally not easy. It's, it's really hard. In fact, uh, you just send somebody else to do the work. If you want to experience the presence of God, you have to do the work. Is this the priest now? Nope. No, this is the people. This is the people. Okay. This is the people. The, the people are the ones skinning and cutting up into pieces. It's all about the blood because without the blood, there's no atonement. That's right. It's a good transition. I'm not ready yet though, Gary. Yes, he has the Jewish blood in him. It's just constantly flowing. All right, I like this. Gary, it's so good to have you guys here. All right, so let's just keep going here. Okay, so number five is skin and cut up the sacrifice. Okay, I think we got that part right there. Now, if we keep going here to uh, number five, sorry here. Uh, then it says, and the sons of Aaron, I'm in verse seven. The sons of Aaron, the priest will prepare a fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Then look what it says. Uh, so in number six, okay, I want to make sure we're doing this right. Uh, yeah, number six, I'm going to add this. Some of the commentators just kind of leave this part out. They kind of just assume it's kind of normal, but I kind of think it's important. So we'll just say they're preparing a fire. Is that all right? And you, Rich, you ready for this one? You guys, we get it. It's just... It's okay. When people on radio, they're like, what are they doing right now? I'm drawing a fire right now. So these guys are, oh, this is, survey says, oh, jeez, <laughs> so wrong. Sometimes when we do that, it feels like a really bad sitcom right now. You know, like a bad late night show that only airs at one in the morning. That would be us right now. So anyway, all right, so they're preparing a fire. Uh, th that's the priest side. Remember, the priest side are preparing a fire. Now watch as it continues on. 
uh, in verse 8, the sons of the priests are to arrange the pieces, the head and the suet on suet, suet on the top of the burning wood on the altar. OK, so that's what they're doing. They are arranging the fire. And then now that just says just I'm going to go one more step here. Uh, they need to arrange the pieces. OK, anybody want to jump in? What are they arranging the pieces of? The sacrifice, the bull. Good. So now they're integrating the pieces that have been cut up. OK, does that make sense? So now there's a little bit of both. The priests are taking, so they're arranging the pieces of the sacrifice. We're so not going to get to where we want to go to today, but welcome to Leviticus. Who would have thought we could talk this long about just killing one animal? Not me. All right, so forgive me, Lord. All right, so let's keep going here. In verse 9, it says this, the offerer must watch. That's the offer. That's the donor. That's the owner. That's the people. OK, so we're going to go to number 8. OK, it says the offerer. Uh, must wash its entrails and shanks with water. So what you're going to see very simply is, is that you're going to see a washing. Okay, so now they're washing parts. Okay, but you see how it's just kind of back and forth. It's very, it's a very interactive and it's all taking place at something that Moses and all the Israelites just built. So up until then, you wonder why they're aimlessly going after golden calves because they didn't have anywhere to put their focus. I think that's so true with each one of us. If, if we don't have a focus, you know what we tend to do? We just tend to go this way. Or all of a sudden, we tend to go this way. And, you know, people say, well, why do I need to go to church? Because I think you need to surround yourself. As in Hebrews, it says, and not forsake the, the gathering and the assembly of people because they help us stay in line. We need that accountability. And yet the reality is, is without this tabernacle, the people are wondrously just uh, going all over the place. And so he says, I'm going to give you some structure to make sure you know which lane to walk in. And if you don't have the Messiah, you don't have a lane. And in that context, you don't have a tabernacle. You don't know where to go. And so he begins just to walk through. This is how you can approach me. And man, we got to get going here. OK, number nine. Let's just keep going here. OK, it just says after he's doing some washing, then it says the priest will burn all, all of it on the altar as a burnt offering, as a fire, a fire offering as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. What an awesome picture. And you purification. Purification. Burn it up. All of it. And it's a great word, Gary. Uh, purification. And we're going to get to some of that even down the road here of talking about the different offerings. But who would have thought that as soon as this is implemented, all of the Israelites are now told, hey, by the way, guys, this is what I want you to do in order to approach me in my in my presence. Scripture continues on uh, in verse 10. But if his gift or a burnt offering is from the flock, from sheep or goats, he's to present an unblemished male. And so now here's what I want you to understand. The same exact procedure, the exact same procedure that you are going to see for a burnt offering. OK, uh, it happens for a bull. It also happens for sheep and goats. Nothing changes. Absolutely nothing changes when you're coming before the Lord. Oh, man, there's so much here. I, I'm just going to go here. Can you go to Mark 12, 33? This is an image of the New Testament. I'm going to totally cheat and go ahead really quick because I don't want us to miss this, you guys, especially in your readings and going along in your reading guides. Okay, Mark 12, verse 33, if you can, Kevin. Mark 12, verse 33. Here you have the, the Gospels. And to love him, watch this. So, What's better than all that we just went through? What's better than laying your hands on a bull and slaughtering it? Well, I can think of a lot of things, actually, that are better <laughs> than collecting and sprinkling the blood and skinning and cutting and preparing a fire. What's better than washing the parts or arranging the pieces or burning up at all? And this is what the scripture says. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Man, I look at this and you just think, what? That right there, you're telling me if I go love my neighbor or I go love one of these guys right here, that's better than killing a, a bull? Jesus says, absolutely. This is the image that I'm after. But what's crazy is, is you got to understand that these components all point to that perfect Atonement. And so our word, okay, our word for all of Leviticus, Leviticus 1, 2, 3, all the way through 27 is atonement. And I want to give you, we're going <laughs> to try to do this in three minutes, okay? 
a quick backdrop on the word atonement, because what happens is, is that this right here, and if you would, guys, can you go back to, go to Kevin, can you go to Leviticus 1, verse 4? Do you remember it says that when we put our hand on the head, and so that why? So that we can be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. So this whole thing, this whole thing is so that we can get atonement. All right. Anybody want to guess on just atonement? What's the first thing that comes to your mind on atonement? Anybody want to just shoot? Anybody over here? Uh, team blue or team red? Uh, Mike, what do you got? <laughs> cover. Yeah, to cover, to atone for, okay? Here's what I want to do. It's a good word. Uh, I want to give you Tom Constable, okay? He used to be a professor at Dallas Seminary. I'm going to give you three things, okay? First of all, that word atonement. So we go through this whole process, so that we can be accepted. The Israelites want to be accepted so that they can be atoned for. Number one is, it just simply says that atonement serves as a substitution. Okay? Number one is it serves as, an, as a substitution. The animal is going to stand in place of the sinner. The animal is this bull, this pigeon. Man, I really wanted to twist the pigeon's head because that's what the priest has to do. There's a lot there in Leviticus 1. Uh, and following, but this animal serves as a substitute. So the blood that Mindy has painted over here, this blood, look at, man, that is so powerful. And again, we'll talk more about this, but look at this Israeli flower. You'll start seeing more and more of, of a, a theme. I'll just say this. This right here, this blood, this animal's blood atoned. Perfect animal's blood. Perfect animal's blood. Thanks. Perfect, unblemished, non-crooked eyes. Like this is the real deal. And atonement is simply to stand as a substitution for us. Okay, number two, just so you have a, it had to be, and we talked about this word, you guys, imputation. <laughs> imputation, don't worry, I didn't know what it meant earlier. Gary, you did. I know you talked about this, but it's when God transfers the guilt of the Israelite who's bringing this animal, who's bringing this animal to the table. He transfers the guilt of the sinner and then he puts it on by putting his hands on the animal. It's like this cool transfer, like boom, it's there. That's what we're talking about. This animal serves as a substitute or as an imputation, like it's receiving the guilt that we deserved. Okay, and then finally, the very last thing is, and again, there's multiple, more than just this, this isn't it, but uh, the only one, is, is that it, this is a cool one, the atonement, it had to be death. You have to see ultimate death in order for atonement to work. It's not just cut off a leg or cut off an arm. It's literally death. This will always lead to death. Bloodshed is what brings, is what comes from death. You know, there's a lot here, you guys. Leviticus 1, 2. In Leviticus 2, just so everybody knows, Leviticus 2, oh man, talks about the, the meal offering, the grain offering. And then Leviticus 3 talks about the fellowship and the peace offering. I promise you, we've got plenty more chapters to cover these. So even though we didn't get to them today, um, Man, this is going to be a fun series. It's going to be a fun book of the Bible. And guys, I want to just say thanks for jumping in today. Uh, this is our first time. Uh, guys, how do you think they did over here? Good. They outscored us. They did outscore you. Well done today. And uh, all right, team, those that are watching online or on, on radio, just want to say this. Uh, Leviticus 1, 2, and 3, we're going to constantly be pointing to the atonement of Christ. Have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks.